It is my pleasure to welcome you all here again. Uh, in our uh, last day of, uh, of uh, European Association of Israel Studies, eighth annual conference. And uh, at the same time, uh, in today's, uh, today's uh, round table, uh, it's a part of uh, another, another uh, event uh, called uh, Israeli House University. Uh, we, are, uh, we are very uh, grateful and pleased to, to welcome here today uh, uh, three, uh, three distinguished ambassadors uh, of, the, of the Czech Republic to different countries of uh, the Eastern region and North Africa. Uh, and, uh, Professor Johanna Dibua. Uh, the, the panel will, uh, will uh, deal with the topics, uh, um, the topics, uh, the, the issues uh, uh, which evolved uh, the relation uh, between uh, European Union uh, and Israel in the past uh, three decades. And uh, it's also a pleasure to, to welcome uh, among the honorable guests. Uh, Professor Johanna Diluch uh, from uh, from Yadalon University. Uh, now uh, it is uh, it is my uh, great pleasure and honor to uh, to invite uh, here uh, Professor Tina Porat, uh, who was uh, so kind to, to join us and agree to share this uh, this uh, amazing uh, amazing roundtable and. Uh, just uh, just a few words about Professor Pora, who most of you uh, know very well. Uh, she's the chief historian of uh, Yad Vashem. Uh, she's the director of uh, Cantor Center at Tel Aviv University, where she is also uh, a professor emerita uh, of uh, Jewish history. So, uh, uh, I will say no more. Uh, uh, enjoy, uh, enjoy the round table and uh, Dina, please, the floor is all yours. Thank you. Thank you. 
ground for today. So, today we have, as we said, four distinguished panelists. The topic we said, we have, I will present to them three major questions uh, and present them, of course, in one after the other. We will have three rounds, okay, of uh, questions, uh, the topic, three rounds, each of you uh, will have a few minutes to answer each, and so we will manage and manage in the time frame as well. Okay. Uh, so, I will go from the, the left to, to here and to the right. And the first is uh, His Excellency Daniel Kuhlman, uh, graduated from Charles University here, English and Philosophy, and then did uh, a reign Thank you. Uh, and then did um, a whole line of interesting jobs like computer programmer and you wouldn't believe even window cleaner, of which it is very proud. Okay? <laughs> he was also a journalist and 1999 to 2003, crucial years when well, Israel is always a crucial year, <laughs> ambassador to Israel. And then he is a major and analyst in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Consul General in Los Angeles, and as we say, analyst in the Ministry of, uh, of Foreign Affairs. Then we have His Excellency, who is right to right of uh, Daniel Kuhlman, a uh, Julie Schneider, Executive Director of Aspen Institute in Central Europe, and he was a member of the Czech Parliament. Uh, he joined the Ministry of Foreign Affairs early 90s and had various positions. And most prominently, again, he served as ambassador to Israel. Crucial years again, 1995-1998. And he was first deputy for Minister of the Czech Republic in Poland's job closely associated with the Prague Security Studies and they had a number of uh, academic uh, achievements, or a number of academic achievements as well. And you will have to explain to us also that you obtained a diploma in religious studies. So you see that these are not just uh, simple diplomats, they have their hand in other things as well. Uh, in the meantime, I think that I saw with one eye uh, that the Israeli ambassador, Mr. Dan Milner, is here, and we will welcome him your presence and thank you for, for coming and joining us. Okay. And then comes uh, our friend, uh, Professor Joanna Didio, and she, um, I can tell you that she sent me such a long CV, <laughs> and such a long uh, a list of publications, we, could, we can stay here until tomorrow. So I asked her to send a few lines, and she is assistant professor at the Gavilonian University, author of a great number, as we said, of several scientific articles and books. She wrote a book about Israeli-Polish relations before the political change, until the, before the political change uh, in Poland, a book of uh, great uh, interest, of course. Um, and right now, she is chair of the European Association of Israel Studies, the conference of which we are running right now. It's based in the SOAS. And she was also a visiting professor in a number of distinguished, uh, um, distinguished universities. Last but definitely not least, this leader is excellently Excellency, sorry, uh, Veronica Singorova. And again, we could read the whole list of the uh, junior deputy minister, director of the Department for the Americas. This is right, right now. But ambassador to Egypt, which included an uh, accreditation to Sudan and to Eritrea 
is ready. And then, Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs in 2015, <coughs> and the whole range of uh, positions in the OSCE, in the UN, in the United States. And what caught my eye is Director of the Department of Security Policy, which is not to be taken uh, lightly, okay? And all of them, all the four of them we've seen the world, who have been not only to Egypt and Greece, but to Warsaw, to, um, to the United States, etc. We are blessed with an extraordinary panel. And after me introducing you to, to the audience and the audience to you, uh, we can start with our topic. And the topic, let's say, is a sensitive one and a complicated one. Um, we said that the main idea of this panel is EU-Israel relations, but through a Czech, a Czech lens. So, my uh, the first question, we agreed on the questions before, and the first question is about you and Israel relations in the past, until today. Until the problems of today, the Visegrad, the Czech Republic has come to the Visegrad countries, the big war, uh, the situation, the, the problems around the EU today. But before that, let's have some historical background. And if I may end my preliminary remarks by saying that uh, yesterday, uh, with the representatives of the foreign ministry, the question was, they said, the representative said that Israel um, is a strategic partner for the Czech Republic. And so it is seen in Czech foreign uh, policy. And their question was, is the Czech Republic a strategic partner to Israel as well? Let me uh, start this uh, uh, sensitive the topics with the following remarks. <coughs> Whatever you are going to say about a, uh, about past uh, relationships, we, we all let, and let me assure you that in Israel we all remember the Czech Republic and the, the Czech aid in 1948, the armament the weapons that were sent to Israel at a crucial moment before the, the, the France were collapsing. And these arms saved the day and saved the, the military France at the time. And many of those who fought in 1948 with these weapons were survivors who were allowed to go through the Czech Republic by Masaryk allowed to let them through, to let them through, which is not forgotten in Israel. And also let me say, as one a person who is monitoring and presenting for the in five years, Czech, the Czech Republic has the lowest rate of anti-Semitic cases uh, in the world. Okay, please. Uh, Ambassador Oberman, could you please be the first? Keep talking. Does it work now? Keep talking. Keep talking. I'll ask you for a second. You, you, you will convince me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, the, the yeah. question you asked is it's so wide that uh, uh, now we're able to start it. By the way, I just speak about history at the start. And uh, with one fact, there's a few facts that may not be known here. Uh, this Jew uh, Jewish Czech relation goes deep into the story. Uh, the phenomenon of Czech village Jews is just quite unique in Europe. Uh, maybe in, in the only the one of two places, the other was still in Bavaria, but I don't know anything about that history. Also, uh, uh, Czech, Czechoslovakia was the place where 
three largest congresses were held in the 30s. Uh, one of the known fact is that uh, Atikwa was adopted as Zionist uh, anthem in Prague in the 1930s, and so, et cetera, et cetera. So the history is deep, but since we are supposed to speak about history of the EU, uh, I was in a very interesting time in Israel because it was just, uh, I would say, the time as breaking point because it was when uh, I think the EU Israel relations uh, went beyond the point of no return, at least at, so it seems now. And I think it was the time when it, when I'm the EU itself out of the Middle East peace process and discourse because uh, as far as I can see it now Israel doesn't see the CDU as player and they wouldn't allow it in and I must say it was quite unpleasant at the time when I watched it because we, it was short time before we joined EU so we were already part of the group and we were uh, invited to EU events like the Heads of Missions meeting and there uh, I'm going to say I was quite surprised by some irrationality that you showed and unfortunately now it's jumping from one point to the other it seems a little bit better now but I don't know how much time do I have? Two minutes. All right. So, the worst thing I... Uh, first, I should mention Mr. Moratinos, who was uh, then the EU Special Representative for the Middle East Peace Process, who, as far as I know, as my information is uh, uh, was the one behind Arafat's rejection of the Tabak, uh, you know, the definite, the definite no in Tabak talks. And after that, when it came and the terror, terror war came, uh, EU was put in position that it had to decide uh, whether it would stay to the logical and rational partner in, in the region that is the with all the problems it had, liberal and democratic, Israel already will side with the radical, radical partner that uh, started the war of terror. And um, unfortunately, you made the wrong choice there. Speak up without yeah, yeah, microphone. Yeah, yeah. Be better. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, good morning. Uh, uh, I uh, speaking about 48 and your nice words about uh, Czechoslovak uh, aid to uh, State Israel. I remember when I had a uh, first and unfortunately last call to Prime Minister Rabin in '95 when I was ambassador. And of course, as a Czech ambassador, I started with uh, uh, Czech yeah, weapons. <laughs> and he said, yeah, 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 Stalin told you to do so. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so that was my first uh, cold shower uh, on that. Of course, I mean, colloquially, we, we keep uh, speaking about that. But uh, more and more I, uh, I know about this, I realized that that was a heavy coincidence that it happened. Because uh, the communists were fully in power uh, in this country, even before the coup. Uh, they had all the power uh, here. And without the green light from Moscow, they wouldn't do it. So that was, that was absolutely clear. But at the same time, there were some people uh, who had uh, heart at the right place. 
and uh, they were not communists like Jan Masai and, and others. So that was a happy coincidence. And I wouldn't take credit for that happy coincidence. Uh, it's just happened and we are happy that, uh, that it happened. Uh, there were different phases uh, uh, of historical uh, uh, relations to Israel. Uh, and we were not part of the European Union until 2004. So it is not for me to speak about the Israeli-EU relations before that. Uh, we just observed that. And for us, uh, with all due respect to Israel and respecting the strategic importance for us, our vital importance was to get into the European Union, whatever it is. Because these are not our, our neighbors. And this is for us uh, vital. So I would make a distinction uh, between, uh, between this. And this is also key for uh, the questions we will relate in the third part, why we sometimes differ uh, uh, with the European Union on, on some issues. Now, uh, speaking about, uh, of course, relations with Israel will be always shaped by history uh, in Europe. And so the German policy towards Israel is shaped by history. The Czech history is shaped by history. The Polish relation is shaped by history. And we have a different history. And we have a different history not only during the World War II, different record of Holocaust, but we have also a different history afterwards. I mean, 48, that was, I mean, the highlight of the Czechoslovak passing the refugees and, and allowing, allowing the, um, uh, the weapons, uh, which were sold, not given. Uh, and but then, Islam and tribal. So we've got our anti-Semitic wave in the 50s, much earlier than in Poland. And when Poland, there was a high of anti-Semitic wave in the 60, end of 60s. Here, it was the height of uh, love for Israel. It was after Six Day War, and, uh, and uh, all the who were behind the Prague Spring in 67 were looking to Israel as, as a model. They were saying Israel did what we should have done uh, in reaction to Munich. And so there was a lot of admiration. So I'm just trying to portray that we have a very different record. And uh, it's impossible to, uh, to have uh, relations between European nations and Israel without taking this uh, into, into account. Of course, we will talk about the future and the, and the potential there. Uh, and uh, the reason why uh, we see the relations with Israel as strategic uh, is, uh, I would say, a disappointment with the transfer of uh, Western technology. And uh, we didn't get as much as we wanted. And now we have Israel as a Silicon Valley of the Middle East, very open to share technology. I mean, there is a vested interest of Israel to, uh, to share it. Uh, because it's not just business and technology, it's also about strategic positioning. And so it fits together. Uh, so. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's important to, to think about the potential interests which are there and the history, uh, the historical uh, baggage, which is always uh, interesting. But I would uh, argue that it's always tempting, especially in the academic uh, uh, field, to fall into history and to, to speak only about history. But uh, I mean, the practical relations are driven by, uh, by the interests. And uh, it's important not to, not to forget that. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to add one thing because when we speak, and I understand that the Israeli Minister of Foreign Affairs, that we should make a difference between EU and single, single EU states. <coughs> because there are certain states which, on EU forum, uh, stand up against Israel, but on bilateral level. Because well, so there are states on a bilateral level, yeah. more or less good relations with Israel, but on EU level are against Israel. We 
which is quite logical because on bilateral level they have economic interests. On uh, EU level they are ideological. Thank you for adding this. And um, before I, uh, I we go on to, to hear Johanna, um, I'd like to differ with you on a small point. You said that uh, Rabin uh, told you, well, the communists, uh, the Soviets told you, and uh, yeah, but I think that uh, uh, some steps were done without the consent, uh, without consulting the Soviets, and I will just mention that your first uh, minister First Minister of the Interior he gave visas on his own to survivors uh, so that they can pass safely. But not only that, in Auschwitz, in the, there was uh, this international underground in which you had Jewish communists and Czech communists and Polish communists together. Okay, and when the war was over, the question was how to go through Pennsylvania. Uh, the survivors had friends, Jewish communists, Czech communist friends, and the minister, the first minister of the year, without asking the Soviets too much. So it was very good. Please. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Ina. Um, I'm very, very happy, and I have to uh, highlight this that thanks uh, I'm a speaker among such distinguished um, panelists. Obviously, I'm not an ambassador. Can you so hear me today? Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. So I try to do. Um, I try to be as uh, curable as possible. Uh, my, I, I've never been diplomat, and probably I will never be a diplomat. But I am a scholar, and I'm enjoying the fact that I'm a scholar. So let me just put um, uh, the question or the, uh, my answer uh, to Dina's question in a, let's say, academic framework. Uh, I would say that Israel, European, you asked about the European Union relation and uh, broadly speaking, Israel, European relations are marked by a phenomenon of speaking two different languages. So basically, um, Israel speaks and understands the language of reality. So the language of interest, the language of, uh, for to everyone has an interest, every actor has an interest, every state has an interest, the most important interest is to survive, and the most and to survive and then to develop uh, every needs a power. The power can be military power, economic power, political power. Many the, the power can be defined in many different ways. But for Israel, and Israel can be described as an actor who speaks and who behaves um, in a realistic way. <laughs> As for Europe, especially the European Union, and especially in its uh, first stage of, until now I would say, and especially the Western Europe, the, the slight liberal democracies, uh, European liberal democracies, are rather speaking the liberal language, the language of cooperation, the language of consensualism, the language of, uh, and also uh, and the language of condi conditionality strategy. You do more, you get more, you do less, you get less. But there is a constant interaction. There is no a competition, there is rather a, a cooperation. And there is a strong <coughs> assumption that the players are tend to cooperate rather than to, to compete. And uh, this actually influenced Israeli, um, Israeli uh, European relations very much because as long as Israel behaved right, uh, European Union or the Euro all the European Union member states wish Israel to behave, this is in a very specific way understood the process of Europeanization. So the Europeanization in the mind of Brussels uh, and Western European leader means uh, you adjust to the European standards. So as long as European, uh, Israel was able to adjust to European standards of behavior and ways of doing things, it was, Israel was rewarded by uh, special agreements, uh, by special treatment, and so on, in practical terms. Um, and this was the case for the, uh, in the 90s, when Israel uh, was, when the Middle Eastern peace process was quite uh, promising, let's say. In the moment that Israel started to question, or the Israeli ruling elites, with Benjamin Netanyahu, of course, started to question this. Um, 
European vision of the Middle East, of the great Middle East, then the problems has uh, started. So another, uh, like uh, the, the, the moment that the things has changed in terms of European-Israeli relations was of course the enlargement, as you mentioned, in 2004. <coughs> Uh, this Eastern enlargement, two new members, uh, ten, mem ten, ten new member states joined the EU, and among them, most of them were post communist, post socialist countries, and of course, among them, Central European dissident states. And what made Israel and the states uh, similar, or what makes, it, what, what makes them uh, working closer together or looking at each other with uh, kind of a sentimentally, with kind of a sentiment, is the fact that uh, Eastern European states do not share the liberal vision of world with the Westerns. West Eastern Europeans, they still, uh, and we have it in, in politics and in, in foreign policy of each of the states, um, the, uh, the sense of fear. Uh, the understanding of um, power politics and the, um, and this is also justification why, why the Eastern Europeans in terms of uh, security policy are uh, Atlantic oriented so not European oriented but rather Atlantic oriented um, and as for Czech Republic from my Polish perspective and also European score, European status quo perspective Czech, for me, is a, a very interesting a case study of a country that, in its foreign policy, uh, is uh, combining this uh, sentimentality and pragmatism. So you know how to, uh, in a certain moment, highlight, utilize, but also uh, uh, highlight and utilize this sentimental elements in bilateral relations, not only with Israel but other, with other states, but you all know, also know that politics is about, is about interests. <laughs> Thank you. You've already catched the, the second topic, so perhaps we will work. We use better the time and because it touched upon the difference between Eastern countries, post-communist countries, and their European relations to, to Israel and to the EU, which we have to develop, and the Western. Yes, uh, thank you, Dina. It's uh, very difficult uh, uh, to, to add something meaningful after, after three uh, uh, very, very interesting set of remarks, uh, but I'll start uh, maybe even further in the past. Uh, and pick up on what Dina said that the anti-Semitism in the Czech Republic is the lowest or one of the lowest in, in Europe. And I think a uh, big contribution uh, to, to that fact was made by Professor Masaryk, our first president, when he, when he still did not have a country and uh, he was not a president uh, with the Hilsner affair. Because uh, at that time it was a classical, I, I, I don't know if you are familiar with that, uh, it was classical 19th century anti Central European anti Semitism, and a uh, Jew called Hilsner was accused of ritual murder and was sentenced to death. And Masaryk, uh, against uh, for everybody else, basically, against the cultural elites of the Czech Republic, fought for his. Uh, Freedom fought for the truth. Uh, he succeeded uh, in a way that Hilsner was not executed, not uh, totally <coughs> during him. But I think this brought uh, into the, the, the Czech consciousness uh, uh, very, very deeply seated the, the, the idea that anti Semitism is wrong and it, it uh, brings. Uh, very terrible, terrible things like uh, a possible death of an innocent person. Uh, then, uh, for going further and uh, continuing where Yuzi uh, has uh, finished, uh, Czech-Israeli relations uh, during their during the communist times had their downs. Of course, uh, uh, they were interrupted in 1967 uh, when, as Yuzi said.
that uh, there was great admiration for Israel by the communist interactive relationship relations. They were renewed uh, soon after 89, I think in the first half of 1990, and uh, are uh, growing ever since. But I think communism uh, thought us uh, for something that uh, is not transferable to the, to the West. It is a deep uh, mistrust towards ideology and deep mistrust uh, towards propaganda. So, uh, as far as uh, the discussions about Middle East, about Israel in Europe and around the world are based on uh, and include a lot of uh, ideology and propaganda, the Czechs, uh, uh, for the historical reasons, and for because of their experience, uh, do, do not trust those explanations uh, and uh, prefer uh, discussions based on uh, reason and relationship based on, on mutual mutual interests. Uh, maybe I will stop stop here because we can uh, discuss the EU uh, relationship of today. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. solution 